That's what I've been looking for. I guess one of the greatest debacles in Australia's history has got to be the Burke and Wills saga. It involves leadership problems and old doses of incompetence as well and a whole lot of courage too. And I guess up until now we've all thought that they probably starved to death. Well, that may not be the case. In fact, evidence is coming out that they actually poisoned themselves. This story began here in Melbourne during the winter of 1860. An expedition had been put together to cross Australia. But what started out initially as exploration later turned into a race between two rival states, Victoria and South Australia. You see, back in those days, back in the 1860s, they had absolutely no knowledge about Central Australia. No one had been there. And that's what this expedition was all about. They were looking for pastoral land and also chemicals from plants because the, the pharmaceutical industry was just starting to get up and run. Well, 20th of August, that's when they left here, Royal Park. To the sounds of brass bands and the cheers of 60,000 well-wishers, a procession a quarter of a mile long left Royal Park for the unknown. The group included 19 men and around 50 horses and camels, 21 tonnes of equipment including 60 gallons of rum. The leader was Robert O'Hara Burke, a former policeman with virtually no experience of the Australian bush. An astronomer, John Wills, was selected as navigator. The first part of my journey is going to be easy, but for the explorers, torrential rain just outside Melbourne had turned the roads to mud. Within the first day, three wagons became completely bogged. I'm going to follow their journey through Bendigo and Swan Hill, up to Menindee, Cooper's Creek, and then to the Gulf of Carpentaria. Crowds gathered in many towns along the way to cheer and stare at the party. The largest crowds were here in Bendigo, where the town's population had jumped to over 20,000 since the discovery of gold. The rain was easing now, and after 17 days since leaving the fanfare in Melbourne, Burke and some of his party managed to reach the Murray River. You know, when Burke and Wills left Melbourne, they figured that eventually they'd run into Aboriginal people. And they were generally pretty helpful to them too. So they brought along a whole bunch of trinkets, usual thing, tomahawks and beads and looking glasses as they called them, mirrors, and also handkerchiefs. But these weren't ordinary handkerchiefs, I've got a replica here. Union Jack handkerchiefs. And just what they expected Aboriginals to do with one of these, I really don't know. Didn't even have pockets to put them in. Maybe I'll figure it out one day. Union Jack in the top corner of the flag represented uh, Britain. We were still a colony of Britain in those days. Here at Swan Hill, a small flag. town on the banks of the Murray, Burke decided that he had to do something to speed things up. As usual, he was well looked after by the locals, and he and his men were treated to a lavish banquet in town. After a few days, 
he finally had a plan to fix his problems. By the time Burke and his expedition get here to Swan Hill, the wheels are starting to literally fall off the whole show because one of the wagons is bogged about three days travel behind him and he's got to pull a halt here and wait for everything to catch up and get back together. But not only that, he was having some sort of financial trouble too because he holds an auction here and he sells off some of their equipment including the guns and also some of the rum. He also hires three more men and one of them is a fellow called Charlie Gray and he goes down in history a little bit further down the track as you'll see. Well they stayed here for five days and on the sixth day they all moved across the river there and camped on the other side. Everyone that is except Mr Burke. He had a social engagement in town. The local hospitality had given Burke a bit of a break from his worries. But once across the Murray, morale worsened, and Burke's foreman resigned over a pay dispute. Shortly after they left Swan Hill, they started getting rid of some more gear. I don't know, I can't understand it. They've been getting rid of gear ever since they left Melbourne. What they got it for in the first place, I don't know, but anyway, they got rid of, get this, three quarters of a ton of sugar. But the most interesting thing they got rid of were the eight demijohns of lime juice, and that's the item they should have kept because it's the lime juice that was going to keep away the scurvy. With the Murray now far behind, this semi-arid country posed even more problems. This is Mallee scrub. It's made up of around six species of eucalypt. The explorers had to cut their way through thousands of them, but they had to cut the tops of the trees, not the trunks. You see, there's one species of tree here that grows in a really strange way. This is what I'm on about. And these things I'm touching here are actually the branches of the tree. The trunk is under the ground. They live forever, these things. These have been dated at over 400 years. So I guess it's very conceivable that they are hanging around the place, some of these exact trees, when Burke and Wills came through the area. They're real survivors. Also around here, there's something else I find fascinating. That's a mallee fowl nest, and as soon as I see that, it straight away reminds me of the scrub turkeys we get up in the scrub country up in North Queensland. And that's because they are related, in fact. Ground mound building birds, and what they do is over generations and generations build up these mounds. You can see around here where they've scratched all the dirt together and piled it up. And over the years it mulches down, etc. and that mulch plays a very important part in hatching the eggs. The eggs are buried down the middle there, the temperature builds up, it's all covered up, temperature builds up, and they hatch out. The mallee fowl, however, he's got a little thermostat built into the beak. He plugs his head into the nest, tests whether the temperature's right, if it's a bit cold, adds a bit more mulch or whatever it happens to be, or scratches some away, and adjusts it just like that because they need that, that temperature to incubate the eggs. Just a bit to the east of where the expedition was headed lies the ancient Lake Mungo. Captured in the ground here, we have the longest continuous record of Aboriginal life in Australia. When Mr Burke came through here, you wouldn't have seen any of this. This has all happened since, this erosion up here. Don't forget the reason for his expedition was to open up pastoral country. That's exactly what happened. Within about four or five years, this country here all became sheep station. That brought sheep and rabbits and erosion. It hadn't all been bad though, because what it has done for us is give us a fascinating look into our past. Uh, 
Have a go at that. That's a wombat skull with the front teeth on him. See, what's happened around here is as all this soil's eroded, evidence like this keeps popping up through the surface. Something else over here. You know, a lot of people don't realise this, but years and years and years ago, roaming around the Australian continent, we actually had the Tasmanian Devil. And here's the evidence. Now remember, this fellow here was walking around the countryside 25, 30,000 years before Burke and Wills came through here. But not only have we found the Tasmanian Devil remains here, we've also found evidence of the Tasmanian Tiger as well. This is an old campfire. And the boffins have got together and had a look at it and radio carbon date and tells them that that campfire, and there's quite a few around here, is actually about 30,000 years old. It's right on the edge of the lake back there and I guess this whole area would have been an occupation site. But I think the most interesting thing they found is this. 30,000 years ago, they've had a look at all the magnetic fields and things like that. North was over in that direction there. But today, the world's tilted on its axis. And today, the north is up there. I guess you get out of that that Australia was not down under then, it was up over. Having gotten this far, Virk wanted to push on and get to the Gulf of Carpentaria as quickly as possible. But getting there was becoming a nightmare in the soft sand, so he lightened the loads on the wagons by transferring the weight to the animals. The men were now forced to walk. His goal was the large lakes here at Menindee, which back then were part of the Kinchika Station. Here he set up a base camp with ample water for both men and animals. This is the remains of the old Kinchika Station homestead. And this place represents a real turning point in the Burke and Will saga. See, what happened was when they arrived, he camped the expedition over there. But not himself. He jumped on the back of a horse and went in town to Menindi and stayed at the local pub there. He's a bit partial to local pubs. Anyway, up until now, really, Burke was in charge and the two I see was a fellow called Landles. And they have a bit of a brawl here. Something about Mr Burke wanted to cut his salary in half, so he told Mr Burke what to do with his expedition. And he went back to Melbourne, which is probably just as well for him. The third in charge is a bloke called Wills. He got promoted one. And from here on, the expedition is known as the Burke and Wills Expedition. Kinchika is today a national park. But before Europeans, the area was important to the survival of Aboriginal people. We've got about, I don't know, eight, nine hundred species of wattle in Australia and only a handful or so are actually edible. And this is one of them. This is called Acacia Victoria. That's the seed pod there. If you crush them up, you get all those little seeds. But before you can eat them, you've actually got to grind them up and make them into flour. And to do that, you've got to have a grinding stone. Now just have a look around here. Have a look at the ground. And you tell me if you see a rock. It's all sand and soil, nothing. In fact, don't waste your time looking too hard because there's not a rock around here for hundreds of miles just about. Well, 100 miles anyway. But sometimes you can find one. This is what I was talking about. These are grinding stones. And they're used to grind up the seed of those acacias back there and a whole bunch of other things. But they don't come from here. These rocks have been traded in from 50, 100 mile away. The reason's pretty simple, there's no rock here. Whenever you're looking for these sort of things, you look around the edge of waterways like this. 
because this is where the community gathered and this is where they did their cooking and all that sort of thing. I guess it's pretty obvious when you think about it. Every kitchen's got to have a tap. Burke stayed only three days at Menindee before leaving with an advance party of eight men. He was heading for the water holes at Cooper's Creek. There was now an added incentive to get moving. The competition between South Australia and Victoria was warming up. South Australia had failed to cross the continent first, but Burke knew that they'd soon have another go. When the advance party arrived here at Cooper's Creek, they had to call a halt, wait for the tail to catch up. Well, they waited here for five weeks, and it never did catch up. So Burke had a bit of a problem. He had to make a decision what to do. There were eight of them all together, and what he decided was that he'd split the group. He'd get four of them to remain at the depot, and the other four, himself and Wills, King and Gray, they'd continue the expedition, continue up to the Gulf Carpenteria. Well, the worst of it was all ahead of them. Remember, he's only about halfway. He's still got a thousand kilometres to go, and he'd been warned. Don't try it in December, but I guess he had no choice. Anyway, they headed north, and that's where I'm going. The party took six camels, a horse, and three months worth of provisions. They were now passing through unexplored territory. Water, however, was rarely a problem, but finding enough feed for the animals was often difficult. Burke had totally underestimated the job, but after two months, he finally reached the waters of the Gulf of Carpentaria. He set up camp about 60 kilometers from the coast, they were all close to exhaustion, but Burke was keen to finish the journey. Burke and Wills decided they'd have a go at getting to the Gulf Carpenteria themselves, so they set off and they left Gray and King behind, back at one of the depot camps. But they didn't quite make it. They got right to the edge of the mangroves and they could, they could actually smell the salt water over the other side of the mangroves, but couldn't get through them because at that time of year, the ground is terribly boggy because of the wet season, apart from the mangroves themselves. Anyway, they decided that say enough's enough, and head back to Cooper's Creek, which is what they did. I find it really interesting that while they're going through this part of the world, they never tried once to get any bush tucker, never tried fishing, never tried to shoot anything, mud crabs, none of that. And yet this part of the world is really just like a supermarket. There's bush tuckers everywhere. Mind you, I haven't caught a barrier yet. They stayed only a few days before starting the long march back to Cooper's Creek. Desperately short of rations, they were all exhausted and suffering from the effects of malnutrition. Tragedy was soon to strike the explorers. Those four blokes had been away from that depot camp for nearly five months. And on their way back from the Gulf of Carpentaria, they're four days short of getting there when Gray dies. They expected when they did get there that the whole thing would be set up because the resupply would have come up and they'd have plenty of food and men and provisions and all that sort of thing. But they're going to be sadly disappointed. What they were looking for is a coolabar tree. And it's just over here.
Well, this is the tree. You can just make out the inscription on the side. And that was done over 130 odd years ago. This tree's been here all that time. Birkin wheels got in here and they arrived late in the day, almost night time. They found to their discouragement that their depot camp had moved camp earlier in that same day. They just missed each other like that. They got a message inscribed on the other side telling them to dig for stores over that way, which they did, and that kept them going for a bit. But it must have been pretty disheartening to arrive here and find that you've just missed your rescue party by a couple of hours. Only this old cooler bar could talk. The Aboriginals of Cooper's Creek helped the three explorers and provided them with food whenever they could spare some. But they would leave their camps for several days at a time, and when that happened, the explorers had to look after themselves. What I can't understand is that they still made no attempt to shoot animals. But more than that, we know that they had something like 200 fish hooks with them, but they never tried to catch a fish. However, the one thing they did eat was the seed of a small fern called Nardu. This is it here, Nardu. This is what the three of them tried to live off. Looks a little bit like a ground runner or a fern or something. I guess they thought they were pretty lucky because he got four leaves, just like a four leaf clover. But what they were after, the little seed pods down the bottom there. Apparently they collected about five pound a seed a day. I don't know, but I'd guess that they'd be working all day to do that. Here's what Will said about Nardu in his journal. He says, I cannot understand this Nardu at all. It certainly will not agree with me in any form. We are now reduced to it alone. He goes on to say, it appears to be quite indigestible and cannot possibly be sufficiently nutritious to sustain life by itself. Well, the corner phrase he was dead right because we've only found in recent years the makeup of the Nardu seed pod. Will's looked around here. He could see Aboriginal people who were quite fit and healthy and getting on quite well and eating Nardu. He tried the same thing and was going downhill. The scientists, when they analysed the seed pod, found that the husk, the shell around it, contained a poison, a toxin, called thiaminase. And what thiaminase does is attack the B1 in the body, which in turn stops you digesting your food. In other words, you've got no nutritional input into your body. So gradually, you starve. For thousands of years, Aboriginal people went through an elaborate process to eliminate the poison. The seed was ground, then winnowed to separate the husks, and perhaps even washed in water before making it into a kind of porridge or a damper and that was finally baked on a fire. Whatever the exact process, this damper could have saved their lives. When they found out that Burke and Wills were missing, they put together a whole bunch of search parties. Went all around the place, crisscrossing the countryside, looking for traces of the missing explorers. Some of those search parties actually covered more territory and explored more of Australia than did the real expedition itself. One of them was a fellow called Howard, and he came here, but it's too late. Burke was dead, Wills was dead, King, he was just alive, but he was getting looked after by the local Aboriginal people here. What Howard did was he divided up his stores and gave them out to the Aboriginal people as a reward for looking after King. The way he gave it to them was rather interesting. He got his flour and his tea and his sugar and put them into little bundles and tied them up in, you guessed it, a Union Jack handkerchief. 
There's a few points that really jump out at me about this whole expedition. Forget the leadership stuff. Think about things like navigation. Wills was the navigator. That's why he's put on board in the first place. They left that dig tree in Cooper's Creek. Then they marched all the way up to the Gulf of Carpentaria and back again and arrived back at the exact same tree. Obviously, the man knew exactly what he was doing as a navigator. But finally, I think the major point is the courage, the sheer grit and determination. Burke, Wills, King, Gray, they must have been so determined to get there and come back. Unbelievable stuff, and they almost pulled it off. It's a tremendous yarn, that one. Absolutely tremendous. Thank you.